Oh, yes. This is the Hardcore Marketing Show. I'm Casey Cheshire, your host for this epic journey. And today's show, sponsored by Cheshire Impact, on a mission to help people maximize their use of Pardot and Salesforce. CheshireImpact.com. Bam. Boom, there it is. Hey, everybody. Hey, hey. Gather around. About to have an, another great conversation. I'm really excited to introduce my guest today. He is fantastic. He's a, what would you call him? There's so many things to, to say. A growth advisor is a great way of saying it. growth advisor and consultant. All about revenue and profit, profitability. Very much an architect when it comes to designing frameworks and systems, like building your house and, and creating that revenue. Really focuses on growth optimization around revenue. 20 years of experience, including the high growth public companies, as well as the, the startups, those successful little startups that, that make it through corporate marketing, product marketing, marketing product roles, all the different roles. And you know what, to boot, he's a coffee connoisseur and I can't wait to pick up some tips from him. Founder and principal at Pell Rock Consulting, Troy Went. Welcome to the show, sir. Hi. Thanks, Casey. I'm really glad to be here. Man, this, you're busy. There's so many things to say about what you're up to. Uh. Yes, I, I, I work on a lot of things, arguably too many things. But uh, you know, as we talked before the show, if you're if you're looking at the topic of revenue growth optimization, spanning all the functional areas of the company, it's you know it's it's complex. But uh, uh, but we'll talk about you know I think a focus topic today. Yeah, for sure, pricing, right? Pricing, yes. the, You know, all the bells and whistles, all the brand in the world that comes down to okay, well, how much does this thing cost? And is it worth? Is it worth the value? Like, mm. and it seems for a lot of people to be this sort of gray space, sort of amorphous, like not really sure how to put my finger on it. And a lot of times, marketers just sort of inherit the pricing, and they don't really know how it functions, and so they don't necessarily know how to um, to market with it. And it's almost like they want to try to hide it. So I'm just excited to to talk pricing and modeling, revenue modeling, and, and a little bit into your framework as well today. And so let me pass you this thing real quick. It's heavy, but I know you work out. So Ugh. Okay. okay, here you go. Thor's hammer. You got it? Awesome. Yeah, that's the, it's the oh, I, actual Thor's hammer. There you go. All right. You I got love it. it. So take Thor's hammer, smash for me some kind of myth, bogus strategy, misconception. Just set the record straight once and for all. Uh, okay. So, so the myth, um, that I'm going to smash that I hope is not too complex is that an optimal pricing strategy optimizes your first years of revenue or your initial customer revenue. That is a mouthful. Let's say that one more time. I'm yeah. Writing it down. Well, let me try to clean it up. So, uh, so, an <laughs> no, optimal, so, an, an, so an, an optimal pricing strategy maximizes your first year company revenues. Interesting. It's the pricing that maximizes that. It's not all the other. It, well, so so pricing is one element of your entire offering of your company, but then yeah. there is de there's a definite relationship between how you bundle and price your product offerings okay. and what your revenue is going to be, which can be modeled. Okay. Break that down. I mean, for in, in consider me a caveman in the world of pricing, like. Okay. Okay. I, I know somehow sometimes prices get on there. I've done it myself sometimes to come up with this Excel spreadsheet to figure out how much time will this take or what should this, but you know, it's kind of like, you know, me with pricing is like me with poker. You know, I'm thinking, Ooh, I think I have a good hand. Let me pretend like I have a bad hand. Whereas, you know, the poker pros are like, I know exactly what you have. You have King 10 because of all these other things. So like, I know nothing. So if you, if you took me back to like the basics of pricing, could we build from there? Well, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, we can. We no. can. Yes. And, uh, um, and so, so I, um, can I explain how I smash my convoluted myth? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so the, the thing that piece, so like I work a lot, I actually have 10 years of experience pricing hardware products and technology and 10 years pricing software. Okay. Um, so I've been focused for the last decade on, on software, but I think a huge thing that, that people miss is that they look at winning customers now but particularly in a software business, your pricing strategy should think through how you're going to increase your revenues over time, your year two, three, four revenues from customers. And I think that's something that's very easy to miss. Um, but then when you're three years into a pricing strategy, you realize your revenues aren't growing and you're going for another round of funding. You know, it's um, uh, and it's, it's, it's very difficult to change pricing. You know, that's a, you know, that's a lesson. 
Um, and then actually what companies often do is never change their pricing. They just kick the can down the, you know, down the road um, each, each quarter. So it's a hard thing to do because it involves, if you're doing it right, you know, all the areas of the company. But like, you know, I believe that it can, I mean, it can just actually create tens of millions of dollars in value alone, you know, uh, you know for a company that's, that's on a going public trajectory. And so I want to go back to your, your question about like, yeah. A, yeah, caveman pricing. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> okay. so it is, uh, um, uh, well, so it's, uh, so it's like, it's widget. It, it, it comes down to like to widgets, you know, okay. to, or, or basically it, like in what would go in your systems, a skew. So a, a skew is, so that's a stock keeping unit is what it means, but it's yeah. like, it's like one thing that you sell. So if, um, I mean, if you're, you know, I never knew what skew meant. I've worked in retail and, it's it's an acronym I'm like skew okay it's a skew it's a uh, stock keeping yeah, uh, unit so yeah so uh, that's which, so cool which is, well, so I was well I was a um, I was a a, a, con, a a consultant to build systems for grocery stores in my long history oh, wow. right. um, you know so you know so there so when you have so in retail like a skew makes more sense but it's but it's still used as right. a, a terminology and operations for companies so if um, like co- coffee here. We're, Hmm. I'm like, oh, I don't have a green screen. Cheers. Oh, coffee yeah. Is your coffee's getting through. blurred out by your background. <laughs> That's terrible. Okay, here it is. There it is. So, uh, so if you're, I mean, if you're, if you're selling, say you're just selling cups and coffee. Okay. Um, uh, well, like, let's just, let's just say the coffee or pizza. You're not even selling the porcelain cups. So in like, it, so it might be you're selling a small, a medium, and a large. Okay. Um, and then each of those things have a price. So we can actually keep it really simple. You're like a boutique coffee shop and you, you know, you have yeah, like in Hawaii, you know, I'll make it more complicated. I'm in Hawaii. I'm wearing uh, Hawaiian shirts and swim trunks every day, growing my coffee, my Kona coffee. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and you want as well. So this is a different, like, so like, so we're talking retail. And then if you're, if you're selling coffee wholesale, that's actually like quite a different business. Okay. Well, I can be whatever you um, want in Hawaii, as long as I'm in Hawaii. Well, <laughs> you're, okay. Well, so, okay. So, so you're in Hawaii. I think the example is going to work better. If we're, um, we're selling, um, uh, you know, so we're, we're selling at the beach in Hawaii. Um, um, I really like, like, I like, like Wailea beach. Uh, oh. let, let's say Kihei. So Kihei is, is near what, cause Wailea is all fancy people. So Kihei actually like locals, you know, live there. Got it. The people's and there's a coffee. Nice, there's nice mix. So there's the, there's the yeah. people's coffee and there's the tourist coffee. Okay. Right. So this yeah. is going to be a good example. And then, so we're going to, so actually, so there are some people that choose to live the life on the beach. Uh, you know, and then they forego making a lot of money because they want to live on the beach in Hawaii, right? Yeah. And so they, those are price sensitive customers. <laughs> yeah. Like they, they, so they need their caffeine, right? Right. You know, and then, um, and well, then there's the tourists, right? And right. so the tourists come over, like, so I want Kona coffee, you know, so then they're, and they are willing to pay, right? Um, right. And uh, um, so then, so then there are usually some operational complexities and those might be the cups that you purchase, right? Mm. So we're going to just, we're going to have small, medium and large cups, yeah. you know, and then, so, you know, those are the vessels that are going to hold our two products. And then, okay. you know, and then we have, um, you know, basically we have our, our basic product and our premium product and, and, um, you know, and then, so this is the, the optimal pricing strategy, like theoretically always has much more complexity than the business can handle operationally, you know, because sales needs to see. sell things. Like you got a barista and like, and so we're a volume business. Okay. So we're like on a busy corner, yeah. we're trying to make money. Right. And then yeah. we determined, and then there's a lot of research that goes into a business. So we want to sell a high volume of coffee operationally. We want to be quick, you know, so we're not doing single brew because we want to sell a lot of coffee. And that right. might be because our, you know, our peak times are, are busy. And, you know, so then, and so this is a way strategically, you know, you narrow it down for the company. So we're, you know, we're making what I call, like a pricing architecture, you know, okay. is what, when I want to have a client, like, you know, so I work, so we could actually go through this in a simplistic example. So it's our pricing architecture. Okay. So our, and then, so our architecture, you know, we decided we could brew each cup individually in this thing, but it takes like four minutes to do it. And, right. you know, and then in order to pay our rent, you know, we've determined that we have to sell, you know, you know, sell a high volume. Right. And then, um, you know, and then, so then, you know, part of our architecture is the sizes that we sell. 
right? So it's a, a small, a medium, and large. Right. You know, and then and then our product organization, you know, is like you know coming up with like products within this architecture, and that's, so there's actually a coordination between sales, you know, and, you know, and, and marketing and product and a relationship. And so now the product organization is, um, you know, so we kind of constrain them. And so let let's say product owns pricing. So, you know, we've worked together, you know, the CEO of the Coffany company, like it often works this way. This is what we're doing. Like I'm buying these three size cups, yeah. you know, and then, you know, we're, we're going for a simple model. You know, mm -hmm. we're going to go our price sensitive coffee and our premium. And then, you know, then a huge thing is like, who are you? So customer segmentation is another aspect of this. Then, so who are we selling to? We're actually mm -hmm. selling to price sensitive. You, you, well, well, so in an ideal world, you would actually gather a bunch of data and attributes, you know, ab about all of these potential sure. customers. It's actually as possible. A customer like research kind of research. thing, yeah. It is customer research. And so, um, you know, sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not, but then, you know, so then, you know, we would, so we actually, let, let, I'm gonna say we did our research. Yes. Properly. properly. And then, Very good. and uh, you know, so that, you know, that came down to having like two segments that were targeted, you okay. know, a price sensitive, you know, segment, you know, which actually can be comprised of our local, you know, local people who are very price sensitive, you know, the, it's predominantly the local people, right. but then it's also the frugal or possibly an intelligent tourists who think Kona <laughs> coffee sucks. And, you know, so, but it's like, so we have like, we have price sensitive people and then, you know, and then we, then we have a premium segment. Okay. You know, and so it's, you know, people who will pay a lot of money and things. And then, you know, there's like the supply and demand curve. Somebody will pay nine bucks for a cup of coffee. And, you know, it's possible to, to, to do that. And, wow. uh, you know, so then, so then, you know, so our pricing architecture then is. You're right. Though. Have I, just real quick. You, you technically Starbucks, like you did like a Trienta venti with a bunch of flavors and extra job you could probably get it close to nine dollars right i, I mean, actually think you could spend nine dollars at starbucks yeah, and they know that and then, and then the people at starbucks are absolutely doing very scientific research about their pricing yeah you know and uh, and sort of a trick is it's easier to apply those scientific principles to consumer-based pricing it's harder for enterprise mm. software pricing but it's actually you know possible and then okay. uh, so like so 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 back to our pricing so yeah. here we've um, you know so we've had uh, uh, well so here's the thing at a small startup um, like a lot of things are just decided by the founder like here's the way it is and if you work in the company in a product marketing or sales role like some things are like dictated you know at mm -hmm. a you know at like a medium set at a larger company you might have an executive team making these you know decisions but you know but a, a key thing you know, coming back to pricing is, you know, like, what are you selling? And then the, right. you know, the, my viewpoint on this is you have an architecture. So in the world of coffee, you know, we could actually have 20 different, this would be a different architecture, right? We could have 20 different beans and then, you know, we could, you know, we could have different sizes and we could have the pot of coffee or the brew, you mm. know, but then we have this, you know, so then we literally, it would be possible to have a hundred different prices in our coffee shop. True. You know, and then a similar thing can happen with a business. But then, you know, but in our model, which I think is good to illustrate it. So, again, like we've, you know, we've decided our architecture, you know, you know, which which is. So here's the key thing about our architecture. So we've decided there's three sizes because we're buying yes. three cups and like right. that part is done. Right. Um, and then the thing about a pricing architecture is it's extensible. And so, um, you know, so it, this is we're opening our new coffee shop. We need to initially make money to pay the rent. We want yep. high volume. And then we've decided we're going to have two coffee products, you know, to target our segments. Yeah. You know, so so initially we're selling, you know, whatever it is, is our cheaper product. And then, you know, whatever is our more expensive. And then so why I call this architecture is, you know, eventually you know, we could sell Jamaica Blue Mountain, you know, so the, so the thing, you know, for a company is an extensible architecture is, so we're going to start off with two things, um, yeah. you know, but then we could actually, you know, it's like a, we could add a fourth cup size, a super giant, and then, you know, we could add a third <laughs> bean price or other beans, you know, but, um, you know, but so then initially, so we, you know, what, you know, our, our, our architecture and in its initial manifestation is we have six things. 
Right. So we have three size cups. Yes. And then we have, we're, and then we're, we've segmented, we're targeting our, our entry segment and then our premium segment. And then, so, you know, product, you know, pricing can actually be owned in different functional areas, but let's okay. assume that the, you know, um, well, let's assume product owns the product and the CEO has named like um, marketing and product to work together on pricing. Okay. Um, you know, well, like and, and sales. So that's actually good. But then, you know, so the product organization is going to pick the beans. And then, so then we actually, you know, could, um, you know, so doing some research could be talk, talking to 20 locals that, you know, yeah. you know, and then you add, but it actually, you could do a, you could do, you could do a conjoint survey, which is like a, you know, a, a market research technique to, you know, to like figure all these things out. And so it is. What's that called? Um, conjoint? It's like you're yeah, doing so it with another company you kind of together, you're sharing them. No, it's, it's actually a specific term in market research. Interesting. Um, which is um, something that is not used widely, except like the big, your big consumer companies, you know, like um, Procter and Gamble selling toilet paper is definitely using this technique and it's, okay. it's not, not often applied in enterprise setting, but it, um, so well, if we are properly doing like our research with a conjoint, we could actually, um, you know what it is? Well, so we're getting complex now. You asked me to explain to a caveman. So this is like a PhD. Caveman, caveman curious. Now. He sees fire and he's like, yeah, <laughs> curious caveman. <laughs> so, uh, you know, at the caveman level though, you know, so we've, you know, we've, you know, we've, you know, decided like what we're selling. Right. Um, you know, and two then beans, that, so, three cups. Yeah. So we have six things that we're, you know, yeah. pricing. And then, um, so then, so in, 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 the way I work with clients, we decided our architecture, you know, which is sort of we number of cups and number of offerings. Yep. And then so then we decided what I call pricing elements. These are also SKUs. So these are the things that we're going to price. Maybe we should save we should save conjoint for later. And then so these yeah, are the things that we're going to we're going to we're, we're going to pay some money. Some we're going to play a local Hawaiian to paint a beautiful board of our pricing. And yes. um, well, here's the thing. If you're going to if it's going to stick for a while, you paint it. You might actually want to have the artist work in shock. Like I've seen like in San Francisco, some really nice menus, you know, that are done beautifully by artists in chalk. So you can change oh, the and prices. Oh, and you chalk. Can change yeah, the product, yeah. Like colored chalk and a chalkboard, you know, or, yeah. or you could print it up. But anyway, but definitely, you know, so like the, the, the marketing, the, you know, like, I mean, marketing is going to like probably pick the board and the prices, but then they know there's six of them going in. Um, and, you know, so then here, what we want to do is like understand of our, you know, our two segments, like the premium segment, mm -hmm. you know, which is, you know, mostly comprised of tourists looking for some good local coffee. You know, we figured that out through research and then like people who are price sensitive, who just need a damn cup of coffee, you know? Right. Um, uh, you know, I decided I'm going to give those people uh, big bulk bags of Folgers that I, I got from Walmart or uh, from Sam's club or something. And then the, uh, the, the, premium folks i'm going to give them kona coffee uh so companies so so people actually do that um, yeah. and uh um well so here's the thing so now we need we need to figure out the willingness to pay of these segments yeah. so let's talk about the like the inexpensive people yeah. if it if they are you know and then there's another aspect like competition definitely matters True. you know in you know in all businesses so um you know and then and then profitability so for our our, our low end you know so we might choose you know, from a positioning of the company that we, you know, we want to, we want to have a low and high, but we're just a higher end shop. So you know, oh, I said there's oh, a lot of things involved. Like, so everything. what is our branding? You know, yeah. because if we're like a higher end branding, like we can't sell, well, it'd be hard to sell. Well, this is the marketing challenge, right? So we might be selling, you know, basically if we're going to be super price sensitive, we want to be profitable. We have to sell this as cheap as possible. We have to buy some really cheap, beans <laughs> that you know that's that's one option which is just the entry level coffee and then premium kona you yeah know, well, leftover you know, grounds from dunkin donuts you know we just got them out of the trash you know um yeah and uh well so <laughs> i um you know, i actually did a speech on coffee because i'm definitely obsessed when i when i did a speech when i minored in speech in college i chose oh, cool. to speak about coffee and so it turns out like the cheaper beans are called robusta and they're grown in the lowlands and they're higher volume Okay. And then the, the more expensive beans are Arabican and they're, they're grown in the highlands and they're more expensive. Um, and uh, um, so we are, um, so I actually think for the business, you know, again, like I worked in 
corporate marketing, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so, so I think for this business, like we might want to not sell absolute garbage coffee for cheap. Right. C you know, cause and, it's like the dilemma of trying to be everything to everyone and then no one's happy. And then what would Mark to, to your point, marketing's challenge now is are we like the budget people or we want to bring in those tourists with all their money, you know? Yeah. And, so, so yeah. So, uh, um, well, and then it's also like, you know, so, so I think for this business, like I think, you know, where we're going to make our money yeah. is um, we're, we're going to milk the tourists, right? Okay. So, you know, for like, and then the, you, you decide for your business, like what you right. are, but then we're attracting them. But then coffee is something that is very geographically central. Like, you know, like people are going to walk to the closest coffee shop or have two. So, you know, so I think we can, um, you know, presume that we're, you know, we're like targeting the tourists. Like, you know, yeah. we're, so basically what is our brand? you know, it's like, it's a premium brand. But then within that, as we talked about before, we want to optimize our revenue as a function of pricing strategy. And then, you know, we're going to have a high low, you know, so just, it's a, it's a two by three matrix. We right. have three sizes and a couple of things. And then, you know, product actually needs to make the decision, you know, really on price sort of the, there's a de decision between the quality of beans that we have like mm -hmm. on the lower pricing range you know, are we selling absolute crap? Um, you know, and also if your customers are one shot, you can sell them absolute crap. <laughs> but I think, but I think we want to build a brand and be a good business because coffee is addictive. And, you know, so the product organization, yeah. and this is an analogy for a lot of businesses is going to like need to choose basically the high end bean and the, and the low end bean, you know? And um, so for targeting naive tourists, like I think it's, you know, like Kona coffee is going to be our initially when we're opening our shop, you know, we're going to yeah. have Kona coffee and then we want to have something that we're positioning, you know, like, you know, below that. And yeah. then, you know, then, but then, so here's where the, like I do growth modeling, like we have the revenue model of the company. So then actually we're going to build a model, you know, that's going to be a, like a function of our product quality and what our price is. And so that's the thing where we can, you know, you can do it a mix of intuitively to scientifically. So we're trying, you know, we're trying to like plan out the revenues that we need. We decided that we need to be high volume. So okay. we're having a simplistic menu so we can sell quickly. And then, um, you know, so now we just, we go through an exercise in choosing our, our products, which mm -hmm. could actually use the research that we did, you know, or often it might just be the coffee that the owner likes, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, at, you know, but at the, um, you know, so, well, I, I think we actually do want it to taste good and we could do a test with, you know, locals and we, um, um, and then, so another part of pricing is, is profit. So let's just assume like we've, we've done that, you know, we, you know, we've, we've co actually collaborated with marketing, you know, on our positioning, you know, and then we want to have the high level Kona and then, what, Island real basic. quick, what what role would marketing play in that in that mix? You said they're collaborating with product. Well, yeah. So so in general, like marketing has an understanding of the customer, and then so I've I've, I've worked in um, I've worked in product marketing, and I had a lot of experience in product management, building yeah. businesses, and then so the way theoretically that this should work is the marketing's touch with the customer, so they should bring in, you know, marketing can bring in customer requirements. Like okay. in the coffee shop, your marketing person might be the, like the, the barista that you hired away who knows the locals you like and right. what they want. And so that, so then marketing could feed in the requirements, you know, which would be, you know, basically Folgers is crap, you know, actually, you know what it might be that the, I know that the locals like, you know, the Hawaiian Arabican blend, you know, or so like the, mm. the, the, the low lowland, you know, maybe we're just selling local coffee you know, and some of it is grown in the lowlands on Oahu, right. you know, and then the Kona comes from Kona. So maybe this is it. So, you know, and, and so, but, you know, but in general, you know, marketing might, might also have a sense of, of willingness to pay, which is something we can study. So what, right. what we want to know is the willingness to pay of our, our, um, our entry level are like our low price customers and our high price customers, right. you know, and then, and then the other thing, like in our pricing matrix is there actually can be a lot of science. So, you know, so we're having a sign painted tomorrow. <laughs> right. Or we know that we're having a sign, you know, we're, 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 we're going to open by the time that you open or the, by the time you launch a technology product, you need to know your pricing, you know, and then, so this is actually, you know, when I've done pricing for software and hardware businesses, like, you know, like you from, you need to know your pricing, you know, usually at least a month in advance, Oh, for you know, sure. because you need to, 
you need to have your custom sign painted with the right. prices on it, you know, right. or you have contractual requirements to inform all of your distributors of the forthcoming products and prices, you mm. know, so we need to figure this out, you know, in advance, you know, and then, um, you know, but an important thing is, so let's, let's, just, so now we've chosen our products, right? So right. it is, you know, um, it's a Wahoo blend, you know, and it's Kona. You know, right. so then, uh, so that with fits within our brand branding of being a Hawaiian, we we'll say we decided we're a Hawaiian coffee shop, right. and now we have you know one that is you know one that is cheaper and more expensive. So then you know here's so let's say well, I've done pricing. I know like I talked with Jessica, who you know, and then at the company yep. that she worked at, marketing did the pricing. You know, oh. so that happened. So so but in my experience with a fair number of data points like often the product organization is tasked with pricing with while collaborating with others. Right. And so now, so, you know, you get to the point where we've chosen the beans, like, you know, Oahu blend, you know, and then Kona, like Joe's Kona, the most famous Kona. I'm coffee, thinking Casey's you know, then, Kona might be better. So we're selling Casey's Kona. Casey's like, Kona. And, like, Casey's Kona. And then, so we have our product, Casey's Kona. And then like, you know, we have Joe's Oahu blend. Yeah, um, and and the so logo is going to look just like Starbucks. The logo is going to look something like Starbucks with a skeleton <laughs> in it or something like Casey, or some easy bucks. <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, um, so, but like so, so this is actually how it works in pricing. So now okay. we know what our products are, and then so then there's like two important things. So what does it cost? So we, um, you know, so we actually have to estimate the volume of coffee that we're buying from the two distributors. And then, um, so then the way I've done this, like at um, Cisco, when I was managing their, um, a, a very large product line, um, uh, you know, so in, in doing the, you know, the pricing, you have your initial costs at things, but then you have what your costs are going to be over time. And then like the right way to do pricing, I think, is to set your pricing when you're at volume. Because when initially we're opening the shop, right. you know, like one pound, 10 pound and a hundred pounds are very different. So we need, yeah. you know, what I would use is the, four quarter out estimation of cost, you know, of the coffee, you know, when, so we want to price it when we're an ongoing business. And then, so now we know our COGS, we have our cost of goods sold, which is the variable cost of what we're selling. Um, you know, which is different for software products, different for technology, hardware products, but in coffee is a great example. So then we know what this stuff is going to cost actually per cup. And then we have to do our calculations on the amount of beans that we're using when we're brewing it. And then, you know, and then there's also waste, you know, which happens. And then, so ultimately we get the data on our small, medium and large, what the cost of coffee and cup is. And then now we get to something that's very important in, in, in pricing, which is gross margin. So what sure. is, what, so our gross margin is the variable cost of what we're selling, you know, versus, you know, actually that it's a function of the ASP, the average selling price, Okay. you know, which is so, um, uh, well, so it's simpler when we don't have a discount. Um, and then we'll assume that we're not discounting this coffee, but if we gave a 10% discount to locals and seniors, we need to figure out the mix of selling at the different prices. Um, and then that definitely happens, you know, with enterprise customers, you have like varying discounts. Yeah, you know, which you have an average discount, and then you're like Google is going to get like a bigger discount probably than a small startup. Um, but let's just say that's important thing to do. But we're going to keep it simple. We're we're selling at list. Um, okay. But actually, list and discount is incredibly important in pricing because you need to know the net. The net your ASP is the net average selling price. Okay. Um, and so in technology, it's list price average discount gives you net. In okay. this case it's the prices that we're painting on the wall and we're not discounting to anyone. Um, and then there's a whole other psychology and like, you know, factors that go on with discounting. And actually I love businesses that don't. Yeah. What is your take on discounting? Just to oh, sidetrack for a second. Uh, well, so like, so, um, so to sidetrack onto discounting. So, so I think when you're doing the pricing strategy, you need, you, you should figure out in advance what your blended average discount is going to be for all of your products. And so that actually involves working with sales and, you know, coming up with a discounting policy, you know, so in a, in a company that you, you do Pardot consulting, right? So if you're, sure. if you're using a system, you know, to sell, you can actually have approvals and then the right way to do it if you're selling to enterprise is to work out in advance, actually. So sales, 
can tell you there's often a predominant discount in a particular segment, you know, like mm -hmm. customers expect a certain amount of discount. Oh, I gotcha. Um, so that, so that, um, so I've, I've, you know, done pricing strategy where basically in China, you have to discount a whole lot more than in North America. So we created a, a Chinese price list that had inflated list prices right? because the salespeople had to give higher discounts and then to get to the same net. So, you know, basically you need to know in advance what your discounting policy and practices are to enable you to calculate your average discount for each product offering because that um, your ASP, like the revenue that you're going to get from selling it, which is the net revenue. Yeah. You need to use to come back to our example. So we, we have our, you know, in that case, so, so, so it's really to thinking through in advance, considering the competitive environment and the psychology of sales, yeah. what your discounting is going to be like, you know, the range and the escalations to know, you know, where you need to set your list price so that you, you know what your discounting is and then you know the revenue. And then going back to the coffee example, we know our COGS. Yeah. And so the gross Costs. margin, yeah, the costs, uh, uh, COGS is, um, cost of goods sold. Right. So in, um, uh, so when, you know, in, uh, well, all companies that I've worked with, like, like, well, the finance people are going to look at COGS in, um, so COGS is cost of goods sold, like in your financials, which get reported to wall street if you're public. Sure. So that's a, like a common term, which is basically the cost and it's the variable cost of the product. So then, so we need to, so, the, so basically we, so in our coffee shop, our, our strategic question is, are we doing a senior and local discount or are we not? Right. I'm going to go ahead and argue as your consultant that yeah, we're not me. doing that because it's, do it. it's like, it's no, it's complicated because what people care about is the net, you know? So if it's a dollar coffee at a 10% discount, it's 90 cents. I'm arguing for coffee. Let's keep it simple. And just sell it for ninety cents, and that's it, and get the price right. You know, I mean, yeah, otherwise, say, hollow. Yeah, we're just everybody's the same. We all pay the same. Yeah, an incredibly important thing to think through yeah. prior to your pricing. So, like a, a mistake that companies can make is, oh, assuming. I mean, I've had clients like, what's the discount? CEO says, oh, it's ten percent, um, and then I run all the numbers on the company. <laughs> <laughs> and the blended average discount is 16%. And um, so, um, so it like makes a big difference. Uh, I've actually did one project with a bike shop and, you know, it's important to know what your, your blended discount is. And then, so there's basically a problem with, if you set your pricing based on an assumption of discount and then, um, uh, you know, well, if your salespeople over discount, like that will affect your profit margins or, in there's there's a risk because information is like more of it like you know before the internet like you know people had you know no idea what discounts are but yeah. now like it's possible to go on websites and have people post what discounts that you know they're getting oh yeah they, um they, so we'll talk about so, it so i think in that environment having tighter bounds on your on your discount is important or you can also make rules as a function of volume it, it's possible to make it completely prescriptive where um, like the discounting is a function of the volume that, you know, that you buy, but then, so, but coming back to pricing and into our coffee shop, what is like essential if you care about the profitability and success and viability of your company as a function mm -hmm. of pricing, you need to know like what you're going to sell things for, you know, which is either list times one minus average discount when you're building the model. Yep. Um, you know, um, or if you're just selling a list, it's a lot simpler. And so as your consultant, I'm going to argue there are no discounts and there are 10 reasons not to do discounts with this, you know, type of business. And, you know, and then one of them is just when it's uh, your discount can spread like a disease. <laughs> True. Um, you think you're giving it to like, you know, just 10% of people and pretty much, you know, it's on the internet when people, you know, like people just find out and then you have to give the discount to everyone. Um, and then you can end up being in a position where you want to raise prices, which is always very painful. So, um, you know, so back to our, like our pricing, you know, which should actually be complex in our, with our, just our six prices. So, right. you know, so it, it certainly can get complex, so, just yeah. simple three, three size cups, two beans. And there's so much to think about. Uh, uh, yeah. And so, yeah, so we, so we've done customer segmentation. We know who we're selling to. We decided that we have two distinct segments, you know, yep. 
which could be like done using cluster analysis and data science, you know, or it could be like intuitive, or it could be like talking to people on the beach that are tourists and locals. And then, you know, with some degree of like zero science, like to a lot, we've determined our like our segments and then our products to target these segments are like our low cost offering and our high cost. And we've even okay. named them, you know, so now we know that we're set, but when you're, when you're doing the pricing, you know, well, you could get, you could be in marketing and product could just throw it over the wall. <laughs> right. It's like, we're selling you know. these things. Prices yeah. So that, you know, that happens. Ideally, you're actually thinking through the sales implications, actually the operational implications, the marketing implications at the corporate marketing and product marketing level. And then, you know, and ideally you have a, a pricing committee led by someone, um, but, you know, by one person who could be an external consultant, you know, or it could be, you know, most often it would be like the head of product in a company. Um, I've seen finance take the lead on pricing. Um, okay. uh, and then, uh, so, and, and, and so let's not forget about them. Right. So, you know, in our coffee shop, it might just actually have seen this of the, the client having a business and, uh, in this case, which a bike shop and then accountability to the spouse, <laughs> you know, so that, you know, uh, you're okay. yeah, I see that. Spouse. it's like, honey, you're taking a hundred thousand dollars of our savings to open your dream coffee shop, you know? And so you might just be, like, you know, um, accountable. Um, and, uh, so anyway, so then, you know, so back to pricing. So now we know what our products are, you know, but we want input from marketing actually, you know, on how they're going to market it in terms. So we've also decided marketing said no to the premium Kona as expensive as possible. And then like dirt bag Folgers, you know, so this is where you involve marketing. So they might veto and say, I can't brand a company and pick a name you know, if you're selling, you know, products that just aren't a nice portfolio of products, sure. um, you know, so, so that, so then we've done that. And anyway, so now we know our cogs, we know our cost of goods sold. And then, um, and then we know, um, so we actually know our costs mm -hmm. of small, medium, large Oahu, and then small, medium, large, like Casey's Kona. Um, yeah. And then, and then we, then the, we need to know, we want to know the gross margin you know which is the profitability on each cup that we sell and then that's a function so now we're getting to the point so we've done our pricing architecture and then we've chosen the next step is the pricing elements we're selling six cups of coffee we yeah. know what the beans are we've estimated we forecasted our our costs when we're at scale you know which is different than buying a pound and so we have actually it's, it's assumptions you know around our we know what it costs and then now um we spend a lot of time before we even get to doing the prices, right? So now we have to come up with our six prices. And, you know, so here, like, we want to understand the actually the value of our customers in small, medium, and large. We might want to profile them on their addiction to caffeine, <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, so then it's, we have a small, medium, large for our low end, a small, medium, large for our high end. And so now we actually have a pricing portfolio, which is that matrix. And then, um, so there's a rationalization element, you know, of pricing where, which is sort of a simple thing, a medium needs to be more than a small, you know, and then the large mm -hmm. needs to be more than the medium. And then like a key crossover point actually is, is a, is a large of our cheap coffee, less expensive than a small of our expensive coffee, but you know, we need to think through like all of that. And then, right. so here's what we're trying to model. When someone walks in the door, um, which of those coffees are they gonna buy? You know, and then are they gonna walk out the door and not buy a cup of coffee? And so this is an analogy for any type of business, right? So, you know, we get the customer like in the door. And then the thing is each of these things have a cost and then you know, so now we're going to calculate basically our mix. So okay. we're going to, we, we sell six things. And then if we want to do a business model, you know, for this, if we have to borrow some money for the bank, we like, if you're building a model, the way that you do it is you need to have an assumption of what percent, like how many customers come in, how many of them they buy, how many cups they buy. And then the thing is the mix of the six things that we sell is a function of the prices. Um, and then oh, I'll see. tell you for, I'll, I'll so tell as you, you change for, those prices, you, you'll sell more in different areas and people will start you, choosing certain things. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. So, um, um, so I think for the coffee shop, we can maybe even assume that they're going to buy something, 
Yeah. But, you, you know, so we're going to sell, you know, but actually if it's, well, yeah, yeah. They're, they're probably going to buy one cup when I'm traveling. Yeah. I buy, I buy three cups. I buy two largest for me and one for my wife. If I have to walk back, cause ah, I need that. You're much a caffeinated food. individual. Uh, yeah, I am. Like, uh, so I'm actually using, <laughs> I'm doing, a, I'm doing half calf. There's a strategy. I have an optimized blend of Pete's, you know, which is the Mocha Java decaf and major. You blend those, you get a good flavor with half the caffeine. Anyway, so back to the pricing. So I then what that. we're trying, uh, it, it's good. And then Conical Burr grinder set on 19. Um, I can give you the brand. <laughs> uh, anyway, and then there's volume measurements. But, um, and so we should do this with our product. But then, yeah. so then, so here's the thing with that we're with pricing. So then we have this, we have this business, right? Which could, um, like a coffee shop at high volume, like, you know, literally when you have this type of a business, you're trying to make more net profit than like working at your old job. <laughs> right. So you're quitting, you're quitting your job. So you actually have a job, you know, let's just say like making a hundred K it's actually really tricky to make. Well, I was at Starbucks and you know, I just feel like opening up Ohana bucks instead. And uh, yeah, yeah. You know. um, yeah. But you, but you're the owner. So the owner is actually making these kind of like decisions. And so yeah. you're really trying to, you're trying to make enough gross profit, you know, versus, you know, what your alternative is, which would be having a regular job. Um, I've actually known someone to fail in a coffee shop business. So you want, who did not, who did not do oh, it. Oh, for sure. I, I, um, I almost bought a coffee shop a couple of years ago and uh, until I did the math and then realized, Oh, maybe not. You can, I could, I could do the math. I did the math on the back of an envelope. You can do that. And I've, yeah. So I've had a, a friend who's a therapist say, we just did, we got out a, a napkin and it's like, you should not open your own therapist office. You should keep working for Kaiser, like a coffee shop, Really? you know? Uh, uh, yeah. Because, well, so in that model, it's like, how many, like how many slots do you have for clients? What's the average number of clients that you're going to have? Like, what are you going to charge per hour? Like what realistically you're going to do? Like, and it just, it just took an, that was like 10 minutes in a napkin. Yeah. And you know, I, like I do advise my friends for free. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, I'm glad I've met you. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, anyway, yeah. So like, I'm not going to do many examples of that, but, um, and like uh, a lot of some successful, very successful people too. But so anyway, so we're, so this is, this is a great example of a pricing problem. So we've actually gone through a whole exercise of choosing our pricing architecture, mm -hmm. like within that choosing the elements that we're going to price. And now we need to put prices on those things. And so like, and so that is a function of competitive analysis. You know, you need to know where other people are, what's your price positioning. Let's right. just say for sake of argument, we're premium and Starbucks sucks. And like, we're actually going to be, you know, so the thing is on the high end, you know, we're going to be more than Starbucks, but we might've done our model and on our low end, we're going to be below, you know, and then, Interesting. you know, I've, and I've actually had a client say to me with a very complex model that, you know, we want to be like 10% below, like all of our competition, which is a gigantic Excel model to like, you know, to, right. to deconstruct the competitive products. But in, in this case, like competitive analysis is important. We understand our customers, but then we actually need to pick the prices. So you asked, you know, earlier, like about the mix Yeah. is if our, um, so if our low, you know, our entry, um, what is an entry level cup? Like it's actually, so psychological pricing is important for a lot of products, you know, yeah. and so and then the, the entry price is something that's very important. And I've had clients where we decided your entry price is $5,000 because you don't want to waste sales time talking about these mice nut deals, you know, with small clients. And so yeah. there's always an, an entry price is something that's strategically important. And then, um, uh, so it's like, I think it's probably like below $2 for the, you know, for the entry. And then we might even have our pricing strategy anchored on um our like if we're assuming there's going to be volume and our on what our low price is going to be yeah um and it might actually be a nickel below sometimes this is how these things were a nickel below starbucks sure. you know for our small entry you know and then so then again like we've done that for strategic reasons like either we've done like we could actually do a conjoint model if we're being precise and model and research people that live in the area and give them a series of choices to choose and we can figure out the value of our coffee versus, you know, Starbucks. And um, so we're assuming that we're going to be achieve a premium brand. And then here, even we have our anchor price, you know, Starbucks is a dollar 85. Like, yep. so we're a dollar 80 and we've got that figured out. And then, 
there's still actually a lot goes in to choosing like what the premium is for our other cups of coffee. Um, you know, and then, so here's the thing, if we do a dollar eighty, three dollars and five dollars, um, you know, um, well, so here's, here's where you can make a mistake in pricing. Actually the, the price per milliliter of coffee, you know, or the price per ounce of coffee should go down as you go up. So there's like, there's a lot of rational things in pricing, yeah. you know, so you get more volume in the medium, you know, if we're 12, 16 and 20, yeah. you know, then actually you should not like price, you know, basically for the increase in volume in the medium, the, the a rational price should be less than the same linear price per ounce. Um, so then again, so then, so then, and often when you're doing prices, there's, there's boundaries as we're making these decisions. So, so are you saying the, the price per volume should decrease with the size of the cup because wait, wait, technically wait, wait. it's like you're getting more for less. It's a, it, well, it's a, it's a, it's a volume discount. And then, so right. if you're pricing like enterprise software per user, you know, or you're pricing, you know, any type of thing. So it, yeah. well, it, this is a commodity. Some things are more complex than that, like True. 10 features in SaaS pricing, you know, but then, so, so this is, you know, and then, um, well, so basically like an example I like to give if, you know, gum is like 10 cents a pack, you know, you cannot sell a 10 pack for a dollar 10. Cause it's, a, it's irrational. Like, and actually people are not rational. That's a whole nother discussion, you know, but like, but it should be rational. There's an implicit volume discount, you know, and then, so when you're in, in something which could be, um, you know, so Amazon does this, right. If you look at Amazon's pricing oh, yeah. in, you know, in AWS, if you're looking at a certain number of like, you know, capacity at a certain number of like CPUs, when you look at the pricing model, as you get more, there's a volume discount. Yeah. Like you when know, I bought copies so, of my book, it, you know, if you, oh, if you get to buy 2000, it, it, the price drops another couple of dollars. Yeah, and, uh, uh, encouraging yeah, you yeah. to buy more. Well, yeah, so we, exactly. But then it's like how much more, right? So then, right. so then we actually have like the high point. And then when you're doing a pricing strategy, there are a lot of, you know, boundary conditions. Like there's actually a profitability boundary con condition. So our entry, if we have a minimum, we want to be at, we better be at, we better be at like at least 80% gross margins on coffee. Right. So, you know, if we're, if we're going to be at 80% gross margin, then basically our price is five times what it costs for cup and coffee. Um, and uh, so then you have, so there's, so then we have like competitive boundary conditions and pricing. We have profitability boundary conditions. And then what we're talking about now is optimizing the portfolio pricing. Right. Um, and uh, so in some products, actually coffee, is a lot like software. The marginal cost is really low. <laughs> and then we're actually doing value based based profiting to essentially like extract as much money as we can out of the customers. You yeah. know, you do factor in the cost and then some businesses like cement, like, you know, the, um, like the margins are like really important. Um, mm. you know, uh, cause you can like, you can go underwater if the price of rocks changes. Um, but like, but back to, so there are low sure. margin businesses and then groceries run at like a few percentage points of gross margin. So they Sweet. have to, they do some serious analytics, but our coffee business, actually our, our costs are pretty low on our, so we're looking at gross profit and then we have to pay our people and our rent, yeah. you know, and that's net profit, which is another thing as we build our model out. And so, so then we're, um, so we are, you know, constrained by our minimum profit. And then in generally when you're pricing profits, when you sell the medium and the large, you want them to have a higher gross margin. You know, they're going to have a higher gross margin than your small. So you want to make more profit. So people um, feel like they get more coffee, but you're actually making more profit the, the higher up they go. Yeah. I have to actually think about it with coffee. So we are, if our margins are, um, yeah. So actually the, um, you know what, you know, actually the price, of, the price of coffee in the cup is like pretty cheap. So we're actually looking at the marginal increase in small to medium cup. And then the coffee actually doesn't cost very much, you know, at all. Yeah. And so, um, so we are gonna, um, I think we're, we, we should make, I have to think through the coffee example, like, but, but like, but generally you're like, you're, you know, you're selling, you know, in, in software, definitely you know, yeah. your marginal costs are pretty low and you're selling, oh, yeah. it's another, you know, the next thing. And so you're selling gigabyte. for, 
Yeah. It's like higher revenue. Um, well, if the coffee costs nothing and then the cups are like a penny difference, then we are, we are going to have, when we raise the price by 25 cents, we're going to have higher margin, you know? Oh, so for then, sure. um, and so then, so the more we charge for the larger ones, the more profit margin we make. But then what we're trying to do is optimize the mix, which is a function of the perceived value of the people coming in the door. I you know, it. because you, there's a point, like, let's just do like medium to large. Like you're not going to buy a small because you just need the caffeine, right? Yeah. So you're like, you're, you're like- Only you chumps buy the smalls, right? We got we to go medium or above. Yeah. I tried buying a small at Dunkin' Donuts and you're like, what is this little Dixie cup here? I got to get uh, back to the medium. Even yeah, though so the like, small so like, is probably the appropriate size for me to uh, actually finish uh, it, the cup. It is, but- you're, just you're not going to buy it. Yeah. So, so actually like, so our volume here, like we're going to sell mostly medium and large and often, yeah. often the small is just a lost leader, but then that's for, that's for the grandmas and the grandpas trying to wash their caffeine. And yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and so, so we've got the, actually, so we model this whole thing, but we have to make an assumption of like how many we're going to sell of each. But then the trick is you make your assumptions about the volume and then your three year model on the business is going to tell you your net profit you know, as a function of the mix, because in general, as let's just do medium and large, the higher, and let's say we're, we're already, we're already at a buck 82, 25. Let's just say that's done. And now we need to price our large, um, you know, which is 20 ounces. And then, um, so we can price it at 325. Bless you, you know, 225 and 225 (laughs) and 325, you know, and then let's just say it's rational, but then, so you need to figure out, you know, the, the difference in people that choose medium and large and then the profit difference and then what the volume is going to be. And then the thing right. is you actually build a model and then you make assumptions. And here's how I can do this with clients. If we're not going to pay for market research, you know, I could just ask you, okay, okay, Casey. So we're at, we're at a dollar, eighty dollar eighty two twenty five, And then what's the percentage of large that we sell at two seventy five, And what's the percentage of large that we sell at three twenty five, And then, okay. But you give me those answers. You're, you're actually going to be able to give me numbers because you know the coffee business. You know, and then let's say it's right. 10% yeah. oh, large. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. You know what? I, yeah, but, I don't really look at prices at, at Starbucks, which is really interesting. Yeah, a lot of, a lot, well, a lot of people don't. And that's price ins- insensitivity. Like technically it's price elasticity. Like the change in volume is a function of price. And if you're very price and elastic, you charge a lot, which is why – Drug companies optimizing profit can charge five hundred dollars for an EpiPen because they actually make the most money because people don't want to die. Um, right. But then there's actually ethical issues related to your company, totally. and the gover- government should step in. Think New anyway, Hampshire like, just made insulin like there's a max price on it so that people don't have to uh, go yeah, too crazy on it. Yeah, yeah. So that's a point where we actually need government to send price ceilings. Yeah. In general, price ceilings are like and tariffs are bad for the global Normally. economy. But um, uh, usually, but there are exceptions. So, but like you know, really. So it comes down to actually, um, sometimes there's like reasonable price levels in consumer, you know, like it's like, we're, we're actually going to be 275, 295 or 325, like on our low. Okay. But then the right way to do it is to have a model that's research based or founder intuition based. And then we can actually run the thing is you run the numbers, you build a model as the revenues of the company as a function of pricing. And then if I were, if you had this coffee shop, I would mm-hmm. interview you. You would tell me what the mix is going to be at these different price points. And then I know the cost. And then I can tell you the profitability as a company of the function of price. And then the same thing happens as we go up in our portfolio. So then, you know, so we need to, so then there's the, so let's say we've got the 275 for a large crummy, you know, mm-hmm. and then how much is a large Kona? And then there's going to be a, there's essentially, I will argue that there's going to be a, a function in the profitability of your company and whether or not you get to buy a sports car it, it, based on the price difference, you know, in Joe's blend, you know, and then um, you're not going to be, you're going to, maybe I don't know what you're going to buy. You're going to buy a boat in Hawaii. Like who would want to actually, who would want a sports car? Right. I'd get Maui. a little moped or something. <laughs> a little like you a... don't want a Ferrari. Like you want actually like athletic gear, right? Like right. climbing gear and like and so like a, you know a, a catamaran, um, and uh, so then you so then you need to determine like for the premium like pricing what are you going to sell and then in terms of the research actually so we have our segment 
of the, you know, of the tourists. Mm -hmm. And then, so we want to figure out at different price points, how much cone are they going to buy and how much are they going to buy the low end? Then actually our locals, if they're our segment, some of their, some of them are going to buy up. And then, so then, then, then there is actually, there can be research. There are like assumptions of basically the, the, the mix of our six things that we sell. And then we know our cogs. So we know our, our cost. And then, so in terms of margin, we actually want to make more money when we sell the Joe's Kona, but mm -hmm. that's a, that's actually a function of our cost of that coffee versus the cost of the other coffee and then our pricing. And then, so, th so this is really the, you know, so that is like um, how pricing strategy is, is done, you know, right. for a, a SaaS company that's trying to get to a hundred million dollars. Like, you know, I've worked on those, uh, uh, like a hardware, you know, business that, um, well, when I ran product management at Cisco's product, the largest product line, this was when it was a hyper growth company in the nineties. Yeah. Like, you know, we actually, we went from 500 million to 3 billion in revenue in a three year Jeez. period, you know, with, you know, a portfolio of like, um, different hardware things. And then, so yeah. how you price those like makes a big difference. And then, you know, in the case, when I was at Cisco, we were pricing a new, like, you know, a new, like fast ethernet line card i had to like talk about at the different price points what the effect was going to be on the gross margin of our business and on the overall company you know because if we knock the gross margin of the company down by a tenth of a percentage point it could be a billion dollars in market capitalization so you know you can do this like with very high stakes you know and then um you know but if you're trying to put a steak on the grill with your coffee shop like those steaks you know, matter too. And, you oh, know, totally and I think, yep. um, but, you know, but, but, but I think it is like, it's more similar than different. Like I think the principles of, you know, of pricing. And so, um, you know, it, like it's those things that we've talked about, what, what I call pricing architecture, what's the structure of your pricing. So later you can add a new bean or a new cup, you know, right. um, you know, you could actually have uh, a continuously variable. You could sell coffee by the ounce would be another pricing architecture is like, we're environmental you're bringing in your own cup and like, and we're selling it like by the ounce and giving you a, you know, that would be another way to, that do would it. be another, yeah. People could come get, you know, but, but, but with like software business, actually, you know, um, it's a difference between the SaaS model and the usage based model. And then, so there are a lot of things that are particular to a business to think about, you know, the different ways you can sell products and, you know, and, and sometimes it's dictated by your competitive environment. You know, in the cement environment, we're probably selling cement trucks full of cement, you know, um, and, right. um, you know, and then, um, but then there are idiosyncrasies. Actually, if you're selling software, your marginal cost can be close to zero. And that, you know, that's actually, I, I, uh, you know, I, I also thought about having a coffee business once upon a time, but, um, um, you know, but with, you know, software, these things are interesting because, you know, we, if we actually, if you have a hundred software features, like it turns out there's more than a billion combinations <laughs> of <laughs> right. the things that you can sell right. if you do the combinatorial yeah. math. And, uh, you know, so then those are very interesting problems, but it's the same principles, you know, whereas, you know, we're figuring out like with software, like an exercise is what are we going to choose to sell? Like we're selling to different segments, you know, often product management is, you know, developing features. Mm -hmm. And then what bundles are we going to put those into? And then how do we price them? And, um, and actually, if I want to come back to the myth that I'm busting. Yeah. Bring uh, it full circle. To, to, bring, to bring that through. So, then, so let's switch to a SaaS business and pricing software. But it's exactly the same principles where, you know, we come up with a pricing architecture, you know, but it could be, well, I actually someone who didn't hire me as a client, I could have fixed their problem. The VCs <laughs> weren't funding them, you know, because the problem that they had is they designed their pricing where the all in widget was $50,000. So they did, it was a Stanford PhD, there's this fancy thing. And they came up with pricing, often founders invent the first pricing, but the VCs weren't funding them is because you're selling to Microsoft. This is actually true. Mm. You're, you're charging them $50,000 a year and you have no way next year to charge them more than fifty thousand dollars so 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 this is the thing that people miss and then you know like it's called net retention in in software businesses you know but it the same principle actually applies to hamburgers you know and that you huh. you know somebody buys like two hamburgers you know like this month 
how many of they're going to, well, hamburgers are a bad example, you know, but, um, uh, yeah, but it's you know, almost but like lunchtime. Eight, so it's a great example. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, well, it like, it, I mean, it still <laughs> is that, well, well, I guess it is net retention. So this is more a function of your product. If your hamburger is really good. And so it is true. Actually, if your hamburger is like, you know, $15, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you're not in Vegas, like right. people probably aren't going to come back to the next one. So we're trying to, so net retention, you know, so I we hear, acquire yeah. the customer in month, like in month one for the hamburger business. And then, hey, you know, basically it, it, it's all about what's the net revenue of the customers over time. Yeah. So, so I argue you like you don't price, it's not pricing to, to sell the first hamburger. You know, it's actually the whole offering of the product and what you price it for is what money you're going to extract from the customer over time. But like software is actually where people make mistakes and like that's problems that I work on. So if, you know, you sell $10,000 worth of software to a customer in year one, like you, like the way, I think the right way to do this is to intentionally design at the outset how you're going to get more money out of that customer the following years. And, and, and I've worked with VPs of sales multiple times who have this problem of, you know, customers renewing on an annual license. What am I going to sell them? What's in the bag for next year? And then, yeah. so, um, and then, so the thing to do is to intentionally design this and, you know, what's, what's, so um, David Scott is a VC. Um, I'm actually in Boston right now. I'm normally in San Francisco who writes, you know, I'm crediting him for the axes of price. So having multiple dimensions, you know, for software, which it could be user count, you know, it could be volume, it could be feature groupings, you know, but having different axes where you can increase over time. So for some businesses, you know, it's a land and expand if you have mm -hmm. pricing per user, um, like if you sell it, but that's an intentional design. Software can be sold anyway, you know, right. you could just charge $10,000 to anyone, you could charge $10 to some people, but if, you know, and again, it all, it fits in with the product and the strategy and the sales, you know, but if you have something that hooks people and you sell to like a hundred users initially to one department and it easily expands, right? Um, it expands to the 10,000 users. If it easily expands to the 10,000 users, you know, and you, you have the ability to monetize that and not have them, you know, you have to, be careful about people stealing software, you know? So in that case, you know, your access of pricing, you know, might, might be users. And then you know that you can sell over time, you know, but the thing is if you're selling something that 10 people need in the company and that's it, and you choose user-based pricing, yeah. you know, if it's something that's used in finance to run the company. So in that case, you know, you could, um, you know, here's what happens is, you know, you sell that per user. And then when the renewal comes around, you know, here's what really happened. You know, you, well, let me say like a lot of people listening to this have probably shared passwords for software, <laughs> you <laughs> right. know, to use it. And then, so then, um, um, so you, you know, if you price, you buy one um, seat instead of 10, yeah. you buy one seat and then you're actually, so you might have something incredibly valuable that like is worth millions of dollars to the customer. And then they come to the renew, they're like, we actually only need five seats, you know, next year. So they, you know, and then, and then they go to five and share license. So they're actually, if, even if they're ethical, they're like, your, your software is like $20,000 a seat. Like I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to create a job do what to I gotta just do. do your thing. And yeah. so, so then it's understanding, you need to understand the value actually to each of your segments and then figure out how you're going to grow that revenue over time. And then, wow. you know, in a user-based model, it might be an entry and a premium, you know, and then when you're doing software, actually in the architecture, you can have plans. Here's a, a, a tragedy just in general, when engineering is building like new things that have like additional value. Um, if you have a model that's just, for example, user-based and you have the entry and you have the premium and then, the engineering delivers you 10 new amazing features and your only option is to put it in the premium. Guess what? You make no more money on them. No more money. You got to make another so level you, above that. So, so, yeah. yeah. So you need to design it. So then, you know, is, is it another level? You know, sometimes it's doing a whole new pricing. And then, so then there's a lot of subtleties, which it turns out if a, if a feature is applicable to most of your users, mm -hmm. you might put it in a premium package if it's only applicable to one segment and it's incredibly high value, then it might be priced as an add-on. 
So it might be, so this is the- Got it. Yeah, I've seen 50, a lot of that with Salesforce. Yeah, yeah. it's like the 50,000, yeah, Salesforce is very good at pricing. You know, so then, um, so then actually, ideally your architecture, like for software might have a mix, you know, of like different packages, you know, like classic SaaS pricing is your sort of entry, your middle and your premium, you know, which we, you can call different things, you know, basic, mm -hmm. enterprise, professional, you know, but then, um, you know, but you need to figure out the dimensions. So if you sell professional to Microsoft and it's a hundred thousand dollars this year, when the renewal comes up next year, you want to have something intentionally designed in the pricing so that your sales can increase revenues. And it might be moving them up to a different package. Um, wow. It might be user-based. And then, so there's a concept of, you know, you know, basically um, sometimes you want to price to a value proxy. <laughs> so, you know, so this is, you know, and pricing is a big topic. We can talk more than or a lot of times. So, you know, in, um, so sometimes, you know, you, you might want to, um, users might be the way that you could price it, but you know that if you do that, people are going to minimize the, the user the license. User. So, it's, yeah. so it's, so it's like, basically you need to understand the value to the customer, but then you need to figure out how to monetize. It. Right. So there, there are cases where, um, like, uh, um, if you, if the true Mac, if it truly is, you know, like value per, you know, per individual user for some software that you built, but it can, it can be, if you price it to that, the customer is going to try to minimize the number of licenses that they buy, you know, but it might be that, um, like you do something that's transactional. So it might actually be your value, you know, is proportional also to the number of, because like, let's say you have each user is going to do an average of 20 transactions, you know, but if you price it per user, the client is, the customer is not going to, you know, like do it per user, but it turns out like you give it to everybody and they use it a lot. And then they do these valuable transactions, like insert anything, yeah. you know, then you might want to price to the transactions because it's something that they can't cheat on. And you know, if it's like a hundred, right. a thousand, like 10,000. And so, so this is like the subtlety like of pricing where you need to deeply understand your customers like buy segment right. and understand the value of your features. And then you have like actually a near infinite way to combine them. And so there's right. a lot of like art and science, you know, in general, I would say it's more art in coming up with your architecture of like all the combinations, like what do you sort of narrow it down? It's like, okay, we're going to sell three or four things. Like we know that we know who the target customers are. And then, you know, often you get to the point of like, what features, you know, are going mm. in enterprise versus professional. And then, you know, then this is where conjoint analysis actually is applicable, which, um, so I intend to, if I'm successful and I write the article, I have this genius market research partner that's ready to do work with me. So it's actually possible to conduct research on your customers and like, and, and build a simulation model to figure out what features should go where, and you know, okay. and then it's you know possible to get scientific, and then um, you know, and then so this has been done for like probably three decades for consumer things. So if you're actually pricing a chocolate bar, it turns out that there's there's cities in the U.S. that mirror the population of the United States, and you can do a like people data people partner with grocery stores, and then you actually test pricing the chocolate bar relative to the different, you know, prices and gather, <laughs> like, you know, no kidding. So you can, you can gather data and be very scientific. And then the more consumer it is, like, it's actually the easier it is to run a conjoint, but like, you know, so it actually, so, but I'm excited about the, you know, the, the, the possibility of applying this science to like, to these enterprise software companies, yeah. you know, that are trying to go public and, you know, it's things that you can do. And so, um, you know, in general that, you know, there are a lot of elements, there's process that, that you can use. There are like boundary conditions and, um, you know, um, often basically you don't, if you have a, if you have a five person company with a founder and other people, like, you know, usually the, the founder and maybe one or two other people make up the initial pricing. And then often that's the best thing you can do before you have customers. But then, you know, there's a point where you get customers, like you get data, you know, and then there's, um, you know, and then. Arguably, this could be done at five million in ARR, like, but some some point, but you know, before you're a thirty million dollar revenue pricing company, like it's you know, it's very 
you know, on the path to getting a $20 million revenue company to a $100 million company. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I would argue that pricing is a huge lever and it's difficult to do, but, you know, but companies, um, you know, can like, you know, actually put some effort and, you know, intellectual power like into doing this. And it's, it's a hard problem. And, you know, actually all the dimensions that we talked about for coffee, you know, are ap applicable to enterprise B2B SaaS. And they're actually right. applicable to automobiles and, you know, and bicycles of, you know, sort of like understanding what your, who your target audience are, what the segments are, like what you're selling, what it costs, the revenue that you need. And then, you know, the subtle thing is your expectations on, you know, well, we didn't really talk about volume, you know, the, um, we like, so when you price lower and there's price elasticity, you're going to sell more. So with, mm. if there's three coffee places in the, like right next to each other, right. <laughs> you know, so you need to actually figure out like, so there, it may be that if you lower the price, you're going to sell more. Um, actually, actually no, no, really, but, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was like, you know, just take for instance, this, this coffee shop, I, I get there's so much modeling and thinking that going goes on behind it. And that's just for a simple model. But the outcome, and you alluded to like, oh, you get a car or a boat on Hawaii. So do these small changes over time end up being the difference between you're out of business and here's your new boat? Is that oh, okay. really so, what's yeah, at stake? So that, so that is a, that is a great question. Um, and um, so I, um, I, well, I, I um, so I've modeled this. Yeah. And so I, um, so I wrote, um, so I wrote a, a blog post, okay. you know, that I've entitled um, uh, pricing to win today with growth levers for tomorrow, you know, which like addresses like, you know, th uh, this um, like myth that I'm trying to bust that it's like just yeah. pricing to win your customers, you know, today. And so I, um, so I, I built a, a multi-year model for a fictitious business, okay. you know, and then, so there's two aspects of it, increasing, increasing the um um uh, your the amount your, your growth of new customers mm -hmm. and then basically increasing your your net retention um so you know so the the so it's increasing the new customers that you acquire and then increasing the amount um uh, uh you know the, the the basically the revenue stream of your existing customers and can you get that up and then so in the um so in the model um and so I, well, it turned out, so it, it, the model has different scenarios of basically mm -hmm. like changing your pricing strategy to win new customers and increasing your, you know, your growth rate of new customers by 5% per quarter. And then, you know, taking your net retention from, I can't remember what is initially, but taking your net retention from like 90% to 105%, mm -hmm. you know, so like moving these things in a three year model, like what happens is um so i um so i modeled the revenue so i just built a model modeled the revenues of companies and looked at what happened if you can change your pricing strategy and acquire more customers and then if you can change the bigger so that's a huge lever and then the the bigger lever is if you can change your pricing strategy to increase the net retention of your um your customers and the holy grail is called um negative churn negative revenue based churn Got so it. that is you know or it's actually for it's also positive retention if you can come up with a pricing strategy such that you know you have customers that were you know that you have that are giving you 10 million dollars in revenue and then you can increase that by 5% per year rather than decrease it it turns out you know, that the, um, the changes are phenomenal and right. Um, it kind of stacks and it accumulates and yeah. And uh, so it is, so it's additive. And so you asked about the, and so as I was writing this article, which I'm sort of looking at now, so, um, um, so I, I found a VC who did research on the growth rate of enterprise SaaS companies, you know, and then, um, and then you can actually calculate what the valuation of the company is going to be as a function of changing customer acquisition and changing net retention. Right. Um, and uh, so I'm just looking, so this is um, on my website. And then, so in the initial scenario of 5% quarter to quarter growth and 95% quarterly retention at three years, the company is valued at $442 million. And I used like a me valuation methodology that a VC did based on public company data. And then if we increase from, 5% to 10% quarterly growth, 
the valuation of the company goes up to 763 million. And then mm. in, a, in addition, if we move our, um, our net retention from 95% to 105%, the value, and then, so this is just all modeled out. The valuation of the company, like using, you know, public data goes to 1.5 billion. <laughs> um, and then, so, you know, so, and so this is a function of pricing strategy. There's a lot of details in how to do it. And then, so, but like to simplify the message, I would say in, well, so the easy thing to do is to not change your pricing because it's really hard. It takes like a lot of work and you're changing I get the sense from customers. that. Yeah, there's a lot to yeah, it. Yeah, it, uh, uh, well, so like I'm a consultant, right? And so it's really easy for like, oh, we'll start the pricing project like next quarter, next quarter, like, you know, next quarter. Right. It's, uh, you know, it's very easy to do, but then, um, so in well, something- yeah, So I could like listen to this podcast 10 more times or I could just hire you to do it for me. You know? uh, well, you, you could hire me to do it. And then, so I, uh, uh, you, you, you could. And then actually- like in my experience, like what happens is, so product has a piece of pricing, mm -hmm. care, they care about it. Like marketing cares about it on a varying degree, depending on the company. Sales cares a lot, yeah. you know, and then, you know, sometimes sales just might want to like move the, you know, the pricing up and then finance yeah. cares about it because, you know, in, well, so here's, you talked about like success or failure, literally like this, like getting this wrong can lead to the demise of a company because like, you know, mm. startups are burning cash, you know, they have a burn rate and that's, you know, a function of their revenues and their profitability. So okay. literally like I firmly believe that getting this right or wrong can make the, well, it also can make, you could fail in the short term. Once you're out of money, like it's over. Right. Yeah. So like you make a, a, you know, if you wait too long to do this, um, you know, you could end up like, you know, not growing enough, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, yeah, like, you know, not growing True. enough or not having high enough profitability or not having things to sell. So I actually think you can make the difference, you know, between success or, or failure. And then um, so like in, in that and I actually didn't like I, I, I didn't have the goal. Like, so I just built the model. I had written this whole article. I built a model behind it. You know, like I found a VC who figured out, I just plugged in the numbers and then mm -hmm. literally at three years, like the difference was a $500 million valuation to a 1.5 billion. So literally, um, you know, it was created a billion dollars in value in three years. Um, you know, just if you, if you know, on these assumptions, but what that also means is making, you know, small tweaks, you know, um, if you got 10% of that value out of your your pricing strategy, you've created $10 million in value. And, you know, I actually think on a, like a company that's shooting for a hundred million dollars and trying to get, you know, a 500 million to a billion dollar valuation, like literally easily tens of millions of dollars in value are at stake from getting this right. But it's really hard. You know, there is an expertise. Right. Like I, um, I, I mean that I wrote that article partly because it didn't like, you know, exist. Um, and, uh, you know, so these things are complex and it's actually a synthesis of a lot of like different things that affect, you know, different functions. And, um, well then the other thing is I've been hired a couple of times to prevent companies from getting it wrong, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so you actually can kill the company by getting something, you know, wrong. So I've, um, Jeez. uh, in, um, well, so it's like, you know, so it's, uh, um, so in both of those, I'm not going to be too, well, in one case, like the product came up with something that like really sounded good and yeah. I was hired to model out what would happen, you know, and then this was a company that was like, um, better part of a billion dollars in revenue, you know, okay. and it turned out in like doing this thing that product wanted to do, like building a realistic model was going to reduce customer revenues, which is, you know, going to be terrible. And then, in, you know, in another instance like there was a recommendation that was made by a consulting company to you know change um you know the pricing selling to you know some different customer segments and yeah. then um it was gonna like you know this is a case like in software actually you're a, a you're a you're valued as a function of your growth rate you do something that causes you to shrink rather than grow it could actually be the you know the end of the company so the you know, so the stakes are like are very high. It's, you know, it, it, it's complex. And um, so I just, um, you know, think that like it, it's worthy of like taking a, a, a look at this 
Mm -hmm. And then like things that you can do is like build a revenue model that is a function of like, you know, what you're selling and what you're pricing it for. And like, you know, so it's like, you know, like basically the widgets that you're selling, what they're going to be priced at, what their profit margins are, and -hmm. then how many of them you're going to sell. And then the key thing is like building this as a function of your pricing. So in the coffee shop example, like you might have some scenarios of like, you know, the low price, the high price, like the really expensive large cup. And you know what? Look at Starbucks when you're looking at the coffee. I know, it's right? like it's like a buck eighty-five for a small, two for a medium, and two twenty for a large, you know, because their marginal cost is close to zero. Mm-hmm. You know, so you know, in some cases that's your your optimal pricing strategy. But then with software companies, it literally might be five thousand, ten thousand and thirty thousand and like and getting that right as a function of understanding your customer i think can really you know for any kind of company pricing um can make a big difference in the in the success or failure of the company and and or or out of the park success is 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 my belief and i have some mathematics and models behind it and um like well i guess once upon a time i did grow a business from 500 million to 3 billion in three years um and, I can um, see why you're a wizard. Uh, <laughs> you're a wizard, man. Uh, but you know, well, it's also possible that it was going to grow anyway, and like I did all sure. the wrong things. That's like great a hard product, thing, great, but, great team. Uh, you know, you're a wizard. I'm, I'm convinced. There's smoke coming out of my ears. I have two pages of notes. Who are you? How, how did, did you? Have you always had this sort of knack for analyzing things and uh, building models? Take us back to like little Troy yeah. days. What was it like uh, being you growing up? Where, where were you? What's it like? Uh, okay. Yeah. So, um, uh, well, so like, you know, grew up in, in Sacramento and, um, well, where should I, where should I get to? Like, so I don't know. I like, I like school and I liked athletics. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, so you're just uh, like an all around American guy then. No, well, I, I'm not sure about that. Like, uh, <laughs> uh, but I like those, those, I know those are facts. Like I, I, I can't comment on the all American guy, but, um, uh, and you know, so I would say like, um, a, a pivotal point and, um, you know, would like really be in high school that led to where I am. Yeah. So there was a point and, um, so where, uh, I was trying to figure out what to study in college. Um, so this is probably a good point to start. So okay. I, I actually knew, I, so I knew that I was interested in business and then, you know, they gave you these tests, whatever they gave, you know, when I was in high school, which sort of said that I was, a uh, like, like a boardroom business kind of like, I just remember the feedback was like that, like whatever test I took said mm-hmm. that I was a business person, but then I did some primary market research and uh, you know, I had people with siblings that, you know, I just remember like some friend of mine's older sister studied business at Sacramento state and got a job as a manager at a department store. <laughs> okay. And like, that's not what I wanted to do. Right. And so in like, and so yeah. I did some, so it, 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 well, it turns out if you go to Harvard study business, like you can do like a lot of great things. And like, sure. I learned these lessons later, but you know, but if you like studying, but you, you, well, well, so anyway, so I had that data that it looked like studying business in undergrad didn't lead to where I wanted to go. And then I really loved like math and physics it actually turned out that I, I had the passion right on the business front. Um, okay. And then it also turned out that, well, I actually love, well, the story is I should have studied computer science because I like, I really like that, but I, I studied right. um, uh, like elect, electronic engineering. And then it turned out I actually really liked the conceptual classes, but having to sit in the lab for 20 hours to get a circuit working, <laughs> like I didn't, I didn't really like. And um, so anyway, so I went in to college what the day I showed up at college in ele- like electrical engineering, I knew I wanted to go to a good business school. So I, so I kind of started like, I'm, I, I'm a planner, I think. I don't know. So, uh, so anyway, yeah, so I, I, I get the sense uh, that you, you plan a little bit here and there. Yeah. Uh, um, so, yeah. So, but then, so, 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 but then like, so I will say like, well, I studied, like, I didn't like being in the lab. I did like the conceptual classes. And then, yeah. so I studied electronic engineering. I wanted to make certain that I learned something useful so I actually minored in speech communication, like the public speaking kind. And I took, um, oh, yeah. uh, so that was, that was my minor. And then I studied like um, electronic engineering. And then, um, so it turned out I didn't want, the thing is, I didn't want to be an electronic engineer. So I do not recommend that someone study something that they don't want to be. Right. Um, and, uh, um, and so 
anyway, so I tried to get good grades. I was like dorm president when a really it was a really tough election, actually, dorm president. <laughs> year, but I, um, but uh, I had uh, go to the mattresses. Uh, did you go? Yeah, no, go to, no. Go to war? Like, so my my campaign came. So I was third floor as Troy went, a man on top of things. And then, but um, but I got I actually so I put it inside all. So I I turned out to be a marketer. I put it inside all the bathroom stalls, my my campaign poster because I knew I'd have some audience time. Like, right. This could be applied to the digital market. But like I got some feedback from the girls that it was really weird to have a guy in the bathroom <laughs> stall with my campaign. Poster. Yeah. Anyway, so like I, I was thinking just the guys' rooms. You somehow yeah, you got those in the girls' rooms too. Yeah. Anyway, oh, so that may may I, you maybe you need to edit that out. But like, but anyway, like so. The, did it work? So, uh, I won. It was it like uh, I did. I did win the election, and um, uh, so um, you know, but so I actually think like studying engineering is like an amazing thing, and like so mm -hmm. learning how to solve problems like i had an engineering professor say like life is just a series of problems so that was like actually very good training for thinking um you know and i remember i took an engineering economics course which was like you know like modeling things which i really loved and i i took a whole bunch of things just to learn i took a marketing course um when i was an undergrad and that i just like absolutely you know loved and mm -hmm. um so i um so I, anyway, I ended up getting into like a, uh, a good business school. Um, I, I actually somehow managed to talk him into taking me my senior year. I got, I, well, I did a couple of co-ops where you work for companies and I worked for uh, like a company in DC that had some people that had gone to this business school. And so anyway, so I, anyway, so I like, I got in and then I, I, um, my number one job out of school was to work for um, what was then Anderson Consulting, which is now Accenture. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that was applying, you know, basically tech, you know, technology to businesses. And so, um, so I did that. So I was an information systems consultant, um, like working with IT departments yeah. and building information systems and then actually writing software, um, which I like better than hardware. And uh, um, so anyway, so they, so you know, the company said, you can be a consultant here forever. You don't have to go to business school. And so I ended up doing that for two years, <laughs> being a, a systems consultant. And then, um, you know, but then I majored in, in marketing in business school. So like my objective was to go into high tech marketing in Silicon Valley. And um, so then I, you know, I, so that was my principal major. And I went to a very analytical business school and definitely developed a lot of tools. And, um, uh, and then, uh, so then I followed through on the actually the plan from being like 17 years old and my first job out of business school was at Intel. I, I got mm. into their, like a marketing rotation program where I yeah. got three, three, um, three different, I had to, got to do three different marketing jobs in the first year. And so I worked in their corporate marketing group and there I got to do um, advertising and then internet marketing, you know, in the, in the early days and some international channel development. Um, and, uh, when I was in the advertising group, I wrote, uh, a technical paper. It was called the communicating PC. So it was about like the, the PC as uh, like a communication device. And so I learned about networking technologies and I just got like fascinated, like, you know, by yeah. that. And it's, a, it's amazing um, stuff. So, and so I ended up like leaving, um, Intel and going to a company called Stratacom, which is in wide area networking. And so they did. Um, so then I was in, I took a product marketing job there. And so I got to do some um, product marketing and then that company got bought by Cisco. Mm. And, um, and so, um, yeah, so it's so like product marketing was interesting, but it turned out that the product management function like really was a, a good fit for all good of my fit. like yeah, your analytical side, skills, your like the engineering. Yeah. And um, so um, I saw so I, I somehow managed after the acquisition to sell my way in to a product management job in what was the number one revenue product line in the company. And it was a, it was a single digit billions revenue um, company, probably like a couple billion in revenue um, at the, at the time for the whole company. And so I ended up as, so this is really how I got to my consulting business. I ended up as the um, head of product management for, modular land switches which are the um, um mm -hmm. you know you know basically do like you know all but it turned out from a pricing problem so there were all of these different networking technologies atm fiddy there was routing and then like land switching was the principal technology and then it used to be that companies were wired and the ethernet 
like plug in the ethernet. We built the backbone of, of that as the yeah. internet was taking off. So it was a crazy place, you know, to be. And so I was managing this product line that, you know, started off with one five slot chassis. And then initially I did the Catalyst 5002, the two slot chassis thing. And then, um, so then we ended up building a portfolio that had these different size chassis, mm -hmm. you know, that had power supplies. And then we had legacy line cards. So it had, you know, it had FIDI, you know, we had, you know, basically ethernets, you know, shared ethernet, switched ethernet, went through the transition to, to fast ethernet, which is 10 times the bandwidth and then switch fast ethernet and then gigabit ether ethernet. And it was in a time of incredibly rapid growth, but then I had to do the pricing strategy of how much does each of these chassis cost? How much right. do the power supplies cost? And then, so I do a lot of software pricing now, but hardware pricing is like a lot more ruthless problem because you have costs for these things and then the margin matters. And then you have to forecast them correctly because if they take two months to build and you forecast wrong, then you miss your revenue number. And then I had 25 to 30% of Cisco's revenue in this product line. And, um, and so like manage the, actually in, I did inbound and outbound pricing and then, but I really loved the, you know, the predictive modeling of how much of these things are we going to sell? What's the price going to be? And then what are the price for the product transitions? And then, I actually, in terms of competition, we have to price relative to the other technologies, you know, in, in our same product family, like other product families. And then we were in ruthless competition across the company with, right. uh, it, it was, it was the wild west. It was a very uncontrolled environment. So we were actually ruthlessly competing with the fixed products across the company. <laughs> mm. And, um, so it was in this crucible of having to come up with the pricings and launch the product and, um, but the the modeling of that to figure out what the prices are and it, i mean it turns out i like i'm pretty good at predictive modeling so i was able to you know and then relative to the pricing you figure out what you have to build and i had to work with manufacturing on the forecast and um so i just really cut my teeth and i would say that and that was really, really enjoyed it job. too kind of thing right yeah, yeah it was it was it was amazing yeah. and so we had like 12 consecutive quarters of uh, revenue growth and took that business to $3 billion helped kill the product line. Cause we, in, we actually were, behind, well, this is an interesting marketing problem. We were behind on technology and we were like 10 times, we used to market performance and then we were behind all the competition, <laughs> like extreme networks. And then we have to change the positioning. Oh, it's all about software and features. And so, um, like I, I guess the record would state I managed to maintain 50% global market share with the business and then wow. help launch, they had like a, a, a new product line that was late, like one below it and, and above it. Um, but then like we have to manage the $3 billion revenue transition. So it's getting the pricing and positioning right, like on these things to introduce them. But if we had a hiccup, you know, we'd be $10 billion in market cap. So, um, right. so then I just, it turned out that I love those kind of problems with the pricing and the modeling and the, the forecasting. And then, um, well, like I, can, I, uh, I can tell, man, I, mean, I can tell you get excited, you know, some, like, like almost like a mystery and you're like, ah, let's see how we could put, get some data and put some numbers together and, you know, whip out Excel and just see what, what direction we can go in, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like, and like it's cracked the code on that. And then, yeah. you know, and then you're, you're, um, and then every company makes decisions, but I just argue if you analyze the right numbers and build a model, you can make better, you know, decisions. And then like briefly, I had a couple of failed startups after that where I just, I'll just say I learned some really good lessons in failed startups. And then, Sick. um, and then I took a break to be a mountain bike triathlete for a couple of years. And then I, uh, came back from that. And, um, and then the founder of Aruba networks knew me from Cisco and hired me in my first consulting business to fix their pricing and forecasting. And then, you know, I ended up like being co-head of product management, like on the business side. And then, yeah. you know, I would say there, I got to architect, the pricing and profitability strategy of like hardware. It sounds like it, it then, and now you, now you're at the position where you, now you're consulting and you're able to help out. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm consulting. Yeah. And so, um, uh, okay. So uh, I have a question for you. Cause yeah, I mean, this is, it's just amazing amount of details and there's so many things you've done and the schools you've gone to and things you've tried and not tried. And, um, 
and we don't even have time to talk about being a mountain bike triathlete, but I, maybe we'll have you come back and do that. Um, okay. Cause I, I'd love to get into that. Just we'll be talking for like nine more hours. Um, hmm. If you could go back in time and advise yourself on, you know, you just graduated your undergrad fresh on the street, you know, yeah. what kind of advice would you give yourself? So, uh, so you, uh, asked me to think about this. And I so I, I, um, hope it's okay to say that. And uh, so, so totally. like what, what I, what I would advise myself to do is, um, basically, um, when this, like when you're, when you're in a good job at a good company, like if, if something's bad, actually you, you, it's, it's like good to leave. But if you're in a good place at a good company, like stay put and get promoted, <laughs> you know, um, so I think, uh, well, I mean, so just, I think I, you know, I probably left, I got like four promotions in whatever year, you know, so I was like, you know, just like, don't be like overly, am, like, don't be overly ambitious. And if you're not moving up, like, just like move to something else, like in general, you know, I would say like, stay put and like learn things and stay with a company and like get, you know, get promoted, like just stay longer and get more promotions as you're moving up in your career, right. you know, like rather than moving quickly. So that's like piece number one. And, um, and then the, the so that the second lesson is if you're interested in the startup world, um, like do it earlier rather than later. Um, you know, and uh, so I waited, a you know, I, um, I don't know, like I wrote my, thesis in business school on internet marketing <laughs> right there were three companies <laughs> using the internet and if i look back in my life if i had it just like gone to netscape you know right actually i was on a bike ride once when google was 100 people and somebody said you want to come like talk to google and like i said no i'm like i, I want to ride my bike for a couple more years and like anyway right so um uh, so and that would have been a good startup to go to but in general if you're if you're it's a balance but if you're going to do the startup thing like don't wait till you're almost 40. Sure. Um, you know, and so, but at the same time, I think there's a lot to be learned in working for big reputable companies, you know, but if you think you're interest, interested in that career, like if you like, say if you start when you're 29 or you're 31, mm -hmm. like you have like a lot of failures that you can do in your career. But when you get to be my age, you know, like, you know, taking four years to fail is like a, is a, you know, a lot of time, which like went into my decision to decide to be a consultant, you know, and, right. um, so those, so those are the, you know, the two things I would say, just, you know, like earlier in your career, stay put and get promoted, like don't move too much, yeah. you know, and then if you're also, if you're interested in the big company thing, just like never move and become a senior vice president and they'll pay you a lot of money. Yeah. Um, and then uh, you actually probabilistically have a smart friend who did the analysis will make more money as a <laughs> VP at a big publicly traded company than you will on your probability of making a home run at a startup. So sure. um, actually, if you just want to make a lot of money, just like stay put and be a VP and buy an expensive house and lock yourself in, but um, there it is. Uh, to the job. And uh, yeah, so, and uh, yeah, so I think those are the two, the two things that That's I would awesome, tell my man. younger self. Where, where can people connect with you if they want to reach out, connect with some URLs, uh, sites, what, what are good? Yeah, What's yeah. That? So, um, uh, uh, so you can find me, my, my company website, my company's called Bell Rock Consulting, okay. um, which is just like Bell Rock, you can throw consulting. So www.bellrockconsulting.com. Okay. You can find me there. And then I'm on Twitter. I'm not posting enough, but I'm at Troy Wendt. Um, and my last, it's, last name is W-E-N-D-T. And, um, and then on LinkedIn, I'm slash Troy Wendt. And you can find me there. You can send me a message on my website. That, you know, there's a form there. And I'd love it if you subscribe to my blog, actually, which is oh, by yeah. the green button on the bottom of every page on my website. Um, and uh, so I write, it's, you know, like one article a month if I'm doing well. So it's not too many emails, but I try to write on these like, you know, difficult topics around growing revenues. And uh, so I'd love it if you subscribe to my blog, then you'll hear from me, uh, you know, probably six times a year. <laughs> right. Yeah. But a really detailed post for sure. Um, yeah. Because I've seen some of those. Awesome, man. Well, thanks for hanging out with me today. Uh, my Man, pleasure, Casey. This I feel like you were, you were just uh, so generous. Just open up your brain and just be like, here it comes, you know, like tidal wave. And I mean, there's so many details and, and I really have a better understanding of what goes on behind the scenes to, to really perfect these numbers. Hmm. Uh, yeah, thanks. So it is possible and most, a lot of companies just make them up, but like, I actually <laughs> believe if you, if you do some, that's actually true. Um, but that. if you like, 
so, you know, putting some rigorous analysis behind it with a model of your revenues and just, just even thinking through it and doing some analysis, like I believe that you'll get to a, a better decision yeah. if, you, if you run the numbers around pricing. Yeah, 100%, 100%. So much to think about. Um, for those listening, if you learned something, and I know you did because I literally have two pages of notes front and back and I'm running out of space. Um, then share this with someone. Be a thought leader to someone else. LinkedIn's great for that. But put what you learn, your takeaways around pricing, um, the coffee situation. What kind of what would you call your coffee shop? But put all your thoughts into a post and then share and tag myself, tag Troy. We'll we'll hop in there and comment with you. Uh, that, that's how thought leadership works. So, Troy, thank you again, man. This has been fun. Uh, I mean, go lay down now, drink some more coffee. <laughs> this has been intense, but really good, intense, like a good learning intense conversation and this is awesome we hope we get some yeah. ride some bikes sometime together i would i would love it so i'm close to you right now and i got a gravel bike and a road bike so you pick a trail on a saturday Sick. um i will uh, i'll meet you and thank this was a this was a pleasure like thank you so much for having me yeah absolutely man we'll have to coordinate on the biking in, in a little bit uh for those listening this has been the hardcore marketing show we will catch you all next time 